white belly up. This is the game. Yeah. It's a uh, cat and mouse. Smoked a turkey. <laughs> he is down. He is freaking down. Said he shot an absolute giant. Full obsession, baby. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to our very first Fall Obsession podcast episode. I am your guide for this podcast episode, Sam Thrash. I work for Fall Obsession. And joining me today is one of my best friends of all time, Mr. Chester Barnes. Chester, thank you for being on the show with us today. Sam, thanks for having me, bud. I'm excited about being here. Yeah, absolutely. So you and I have done a lot for Fall Obsession over the past years. We've kind of been, we've been working there I don't know, roughly five years or so we've been doing yeah. stuff. So really the past couple of years has been when things have kind of started to flourish a little bit and, and stuff started to happen. Um, we got we got some really cool really cool stuff coming up, but one thing that you know I gotta thank you for is is the partnerships that we've seen and, and one of our main sponsors for this podcast, Elite Archery. Um, I know you've been influential in making that uh, possible for our company, so we really appreciate that. But guys go check out Elite. Um, they are the official bow of fall obsession. And uh, go to your local dealer or EliteArchery.com and, and see what they have to offer for you. So. Yeah, check out the new cure they came out with this year. It's, oh, yeah. uh, it's really their flagship. Um, we Sam and I have uh, been shooting Elite for, uh, well, this will be a full year. And we started out with the Ritual 33. And, man, I'll tell you what, Sam and I have shot several different bows in the past but uh, the ritual really stood out to us uh, Larry McCoy with Outdoor Group was really gracious and uh, took us on took us under his wing and um, brought us to where we are now with Elite and, and I tell you what this new cure that just came out it's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, it's better than bone, man. Yeah, the the technology. Of course, <clears throat> all of you guys that are in the archery hunting, I know that you've watched the videos of their set technology and all that. And uh, if you're like me, you were a little skeptical at first um, with a new bow that came out and has all these moving parts, and and it just kind of gives you a feeling of. Um, in the past, you didn't want anything to move, but man, Elite's really knocked it out of the park this year. Absolutely, yeah, guys, you, uh, go check out some videos. We got some videos on our pages, mm -hmm. and then uh, Elite's got some good stuff on there. And, and above all, go to a dealer and shoot one, man. You'll you'll be blown away. Yeah, man, come check out Cinnamon Creek as well. I mean, they they have a, a good line of the Elite products, and um, the guys up here at Cinnamon Creek they are a huge benefit to the fall obsession. Uh, they they are very knowledgeable in what they do, and if you've got something going on that you just can't figure out i promise if you bring it up here somebody up here can figure out what you got going on yeah for sure so i don't want to make our whole podcast an ad but talking about our bows talking about us uh, shooting those rituals man that that's a really good segue into the the overall topic for this podcast and and that's montana you okay. know our our trip to to montana so I, I know I've been up there before, and this was your first trip really going. Yeah. I, I turns out I got super lucky <laughs> my first year going up there, no doubt. So uh, really, as far as our uh, as far as our level going up there, you know, you and I were were pretty we're we're on the same level, man. As far as as far as knowledge, we're, we're relying and I tell on you Drew what, and and all that. So. Montana was uh, definitely crazy for me. Uh, not only was it. 22 and a half hour drive uh but it was it was amazing to see how the country changed from texas to montana and and all the the landscape that's out there it was uh it was really beautiful and i tell you when you leave colorado springs if it's 60 something degrees and you're wearing shorts and then you get to wyoming <laughs> you will know real quick that you're in wyoming because it was freezing cold um so just uh be prepared for the worst what what was our game plan going up there man man you know sam you and i talked about this all the way up there uh, what let me go back a little bit you and i talked about this for almost a year when we put in for the draw yeah right so we're super pumped about this and i am pumped i've never hunted anywhere other than the state of texas so this is my very first trip out of state so I'm super pumped. Sam's super pumped. We're talking about our game plan. Of course, the only thing that we have to go off of is your year before, right? Yes. 
So you go up there, it's warm, and you're hunting on water and hose. So guess what? That's our, I mean, that's our game plan. Yeah. We're going to hunt water and hose. Yeah. The year before, 2018, I went up there and hunted with Drew, our marketing manager. And as always, I know we do it all the time, but thank you guys again, Drew, and your family for, for, letting, for letting us uh, experience that up there on, on your property and stay in y'all's house. Um, but I went up there 2018. First couple days were cold, but then the first day that it warmed up, my very first sit on a water hole, I shoot yeah. an absolute giant. And, and that's kind of, it was awesome. I was blessed. I was pumped. I mean, who gets to shoot a stud antelope first time with a bow? Right. What uh, was that? What, what did it, what did it score? I forgot, Sam. So he scored, I believe it was 168 and some change, right. which, and, and if, if I'm wrong, somebody can chime in or submit email in and correct me. But I believe that the minimum for Pope and Young record book on a pronghorn is 67 inches. So he was, he was bottom of the record book, but he was a record book antelope. Yeah. I did not, I did not be able record to, in our book. For record sure. in our book. Yeah. I was, I was, <laughs> un, he had a broken cutter and I was not thinking about this being a record book antelope when I, when I shot him or had him mounted. So I had that broken cutter repaired. Um, it was hanging there. It was still there. Um, but I had it brought back up and, and tied back in. And because I did that, it's artificial. Yep. He's ineligible, <clears throat> ineligible for the record book. So would, would have been cool. Um, but yep. at the same time, I'm not losing sleep over it. But that, that's no, just it to was give you, a, It was a memory you'll never forget. Oh, that's absolutely. For sure. Yeah, that, that's just to give you guys some perspective on, on kind of what I had experienced the year before. And so, lo, like Chester said, you know, going up there, we yep. were thinking kind of the same ball, ball game, same property. And we get up there, it's cold, it's snowing, it's wet, and our game plan had to change, man. I, I, I'm going to tell you guys, expect the worst. I mean, you, especially if you've never been out of state like that before, uh, Sam told me, he said, hey, listen, pack for warm and pack for freezing cold. And so we look like the, the hillbilly clampets going up there. <laughs> we had the ranger behind us. We had the cab full. We had the back of the pickup full. And uh, But I'm glad that we did because literally when we come over the rise of that mountain to go down into the, the valley where the cabin was, it started snowing and it snowed for three days. I know. It and did not uh, stop. It, it, you know, of course, we didn't really feel like it was that cold because we were pumped. We were ready to go hunt. And um, we were out there in jeans and a hoodie out there on the right. front porch shooting our bows that that evening and get them sighted in. Same evening we got in. Yeah, man, we it, we didn't care. We we knew the game plan was going to change, but we were pumped. Yeah, and you know, I'm just um, I'm just super excited that we had the opportunity to do that. Um, and I'll tell you guys, go and do your homework before you go do yes. this. Trust me. Um, we the the closest shot that that we had this was me and uh, I, I absolutely made a bad shot I did not compensate for the antelope walking and walking away from me that my drilling was pumped right oh, yeah so he's telling me 40 yards and and I'm I'm thinking 40 yards I shoot all the time I shoot every day and I put that 40 yard pin on that dude and dude I'm telling you these antelope walk at like 10 miles an hour yeah. They they do not walk they're slow. Fast. They're fast, and and when I release that arrow, uh, he stepped through the shot, and you know, it, bad shots happen. I, I'm really disappointed in myself for what happened, but you know what? We gave a valiant effort to track this to antelope recover. and and finish the job, yeah. and we gave him three or four days, and we still seen him out walking around and and eating and drinking, so I know that it wasn't a vital shot, and so uh, I feel confident that he made it through that. Yeah. So for, for you guys, if, if you're an experienced western hunter, mule deer, pronghorn, elk, all that stuff, you're listening to this podcast – Full disclosure: We're we're a couple of Texas whitetail hunters here, so That's right. so we are we are not well versed in the art of Western hunting. We 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 might hope to be one day, but uh, it's definitely not today. Well, I can so. tell you this: uh, walking from my my deer camp to my deer stand is nothing like hunting in Montana. I will tell you, I will be in a whole lot better shape before I go back. Oh yes, uh, I about died. And as if you if you guys uh, watch our video and the the show that we're going to be putting out here pretty soon, you'll see in the commentary where I tell them that 
Sam's legs are six foot tall and so are Drew's and I and I carry about a two foot pair of legs <laughs> and it was like I was jogging everywhere we went and they were walking normal so this old man over here was wore smooth out man I, I think that's a good point that you make though um, not just about doing your homework knowing the environment that you're going to and gonna hunt yeah. but also just physical fitness we not a lot of people think about that with hunting and when you're when you're especially when you're a deer hunter down here in texas you hunt blinds box blinds ground blinds tree stands that kind of stuff your longest walks from your truck to your stand yep. you know that kind of thing you you uh, unless you're committed to physical fitness just as a lifestyle it can be very difficult um to to think about needing that for hunting until you're in an environment like what we went to well, I don't think people understand this either, Sam, is what I don't is you go out there and you shoot your bow every single day and you're in great physical shape to shoot your bow all day long and all that. But now let's throw in another uh, scenario. Now you're walking for a mile and a half or two miles or five miles. You've had to jog up this mountain to get into where you need to be for this stock. Uh -huh. And guess what? You're out of breath. Your adrenaline's pumping. You're shaking. You're shaking. So all these things are factors that you don't do. I didn't do it at home. I sit out there and shot my bow every day, right? Yeah, me too. Well, guess what? Get out there and we can walk up in the altitude that we're at, and I'm out of breath. And now you've got to draw back, hold that pin on that antelope. It's it's pretty crazy. Um, Man, I, I know, and and that's just another another aspect of preparing yourself. So, guys, I encourage you all, if you get a chance, there's lots of tournaments that go on throughout the country. Yep. Uh, I know I know our our guys down at Cinnamon Creek uh, do some out their place a year, right a time hard. or two a year. But there's a lot of shoots out there that um, really, really make you go through some varying terrain and, and walk long distances in between shots and stuff like that. You know, that may not seem attractive to some, but if you're really – if you are a Western hunter or you're really wanting to get into it, man, that that's those are some good – aspects from a training side um, that can really help you prepare Absolutely. for that environment and so one thing that i you know sam and i you you and i've kind of touched on this a couple of times is you know uh, practice practice exactly how you feel like you're going to be hunting yes. you know if you're going to be spot and stock and you're at the house try to make a course at your house where you you've walked for a little ways and then you pull up and, and you start shooting because yeah. it, it's the best scenario that you can get without actually being there doing it you know so that's how i feel yeah. and if i would have known uh, then what i know now that's what i would have done i would have conditioned myself for that because i'm gonna tell you i ran out of breath i ran out of breath several times yeah so i want to back up because we kind of we kind of just dived into to your encounter, which was which was unfortunately the highlight of the trip, no doubt, no <laughs> doubt. But uh, I want to back up and kind of talk leading up to that, kind of what we did um, with the fan decoy and and moving forward. Old Oscar, old Oscar, the fan decoy. That's right. Uh, I kind of want to talk about that and and just recap that in a little more detail just yeah, well just you know as well as i do drew had. drew made me a, a true believer in the fan decoy oh yeah um, drew knows his stuff you know i i have to give it to drew he you know that fan decoy i thought that was probably the silliest thing i ever seen in my <laughs> life a bunch of grown men walking out in the middle of these pastures with this decoy but you know you see it all the time on on hunting shows where they have decoy bucks out there and then but it has to be at the right time and the yes. right place for those whitetail right but for whatever reason on these antelope if they feel like that that's an antelope they are very curious animals and they'll come check it out now they may not get to 40 yards like we got on this one it may be only 60 or 70 yards but man i tell you what that 60 or 70 yard shot's a whole lot better than 125 yard absolutely so i am a true believer in the fan decoy and spot and stop and you know it just goes to show that you there's always a new trick in the bag that you can put in there and help your help your game out so i know we already talked about your shot and how it transpired afterward you know what followed from the time that we spotted those two bucks it all happened fast it right. happened really fast the time we were in the truck and spotted those two bucks the time you were actually at full draw with that with that buck in your sights at what point did you actually realize that you were about to get a shot Man, again, so 
when Drew got out of the truck and he said, let's go, let's do this. Um, of course, I'm excited. You know, my heart's pumping. And, I, and as we're walking up the – you know, you guys have to realize I'm from Texas, and there's not a lot of mountains. So we're here. Here we are trucking up this what I would call mini mountain here. And uh, so when we get to the top of this crest, you know, Drew's going, "Okay, they're right there," and he's whispering. But he's it's funny because Drew's got this fan decoy in front of his <laughs> face. It's like he's playing hide and seek, right? So I'm kind of. I'm kind of humored by that as well, but I'm all excited. So it's kind of a mixed emotion roller coaster here, right? And so Drew goes, there they are. Well, as soon as he says, there they are, he puts the fan decoy back up in front of his face. Well, I can't see nothing. So I just draw back because I don't want to miss the opportunity, right? Yeah. So once he comes back down a little bit to range for me, um, I can see him. And I then – everything turns loose i'm you know it's just like sitting in a, a whitetail stand and you see that deer walking up for the first time and and you think you're so cool and you're so calm and you're gonna and you're not gonna get the shakes yeah it doesn't happen it doesn't happen <laughs> no man it was instant body under out of control were you surprised at how close they were yes because we had already done several stocks, and the closest we got was two to you know five hundred to two hundred yards, and yeah. and they were gone. Either they winded us, or they didn't like what they saw, and they took off. And I'll tell you what, it don't take long for them to get over the top of that mountain. So yeah, I was, it like I said, it was mixed emotions because yeah. I was super pumped about being able to get a shot off. I thought, man, this is really going to happen right now. And I'm going to be done, and then Sam, we're going to get Sam in there, and he's going to get it done. And unfortunately, um, we went the whole week thinking that. So yeah. it was pretty disappointing as far as not coming home with a trophy or a kill or some meat in the freezer. You know, that's a long ways to drive Absolutely. to come home empty-handed. No, we're we're on the same page there. And and guys, we I mean we've already. You and I have already talked about this, Chester. For those of you who, I mean, don't know, we, we when we're recording this episode, we just got done filming and recording the commentary for uh, this part of our show. That's right. Uh, which airs uh, on YouTube April 3rd. So you guys will get to see all this with your own two eyes and not just hear us talk about it. So be sure that you guys check that out. But, I mean, we just got done talking about it, about how it sucks to go that far, to work so hard, and to come home empty-handed, but at the same time, you and I both had something to say about what we learned from it. Absolutely. And, and being better, better, not only better bow hunters, but more appreciative of what we have down here. Well, you and I talked about this as well, Sam. You know, you and I are true blue bow hunters yes. all the way. But I'm going to tell you right now, Sam and I, uh, you know, we talked before, man, we are going bow hunting to Montana for antelope. You know, we were so excited. But I'm going to tell you guys, after about the fourth day, I was wishing I had a gun. There's no doubt about that because uh, if, if Sam and I would have had a gun, we could have killed first day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and no doubt about that. But we definitely, uh, it it is definitely up and down. And... Um, Unfortunately, we didn't get to come home with anything, but I tell you what, like you said, Sam, we learned a great deal on this trip. We absolutely did. And we're better bow hunters because of it, I believe. Even absolutely. If we yeah. ever got the opportunity to do it again, we'd have a gun. Right? Well, not only that, we converted <laughs> Drew into bow hunting on this trip. We did. We did that as well. Drew, uh, Drew. for those of you who don't know, he is our he is our marketing manager here at Fall Obsession, and he is the... He's our guy up there in Montana. He That's has right. uh, some family property up there. He's been elk and antelope hunting up there for years. He knows his stuff, and we we've got him on the on the bow hunting wagon now. Just just a few days ago, he had a brand new Elite Cure show up on his doorstep. So I'm sap sucker. I know he beat us to it. He yeah, got we all us. we all got elites <laughs> coming to our doorstep, and because he picked the freaking camo, the white camo. Uh, his showed up first. Well, it helps that he lives in and he uh, lives a little closer. Yeah, like 
maybe a thousand miles closer. <laughs> and so the, the the shipping on that uh, was like the next day or something. But Sam and I are still waiting for ours to show up on the doorstep, which is uh, like biting your fingernails waiting. You know, can't wait to get those bows in our hand. Heard but a lot of hurry up yeah, and you know the the thing about Drew is, and which you guys don't know this, but when I say we converted Drew, Drew had a passion for bow hunting, you know, oh, yeah. and, and he shot his crossbow and he killed deer with his crossbow. The problem was Drew had uh, shoulder problems, uh-huh. and so it, it wasn't feasible for him. But that's the thing about these new cures and, and the rituals. Uh, you can back these things off to where you can – it fits you. You can customize this bow completely to you. Yes. And that's what's amazing about this thing. Guys, have you ever seen a bow – that you can move the draw length a quarter inch at a time? There is one bow on the market that you can do that with, and it's the 2020 Elite Cure. That's right. Yeah. And the the only one. The only one that's ever been made or is currently available. It so is Elite all those bows that we've shot in the past that – if you're a half inch off, you just deal with it and you make it work for you. You make your D loop a half inch bigger or a half inch smaller. You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. This cure is the cure. Yeah, absolutely. I, and again, guys, I don't want to make this into an ad. I'll circle this back around to Drew. Drew, we know that this bow is going to be a good fit for you. Absolutely. And uh, and also, we one, we, we thank you. We appreciate you. I know you're listening. And guys, we really wanted to have Drew here. Uh, sitting here around this table with us for for this podcast um, we are several states apart so that makes it a little more difficult makes it a little but, difficult yeah but hopefully we get a chance to, to talk about some western hunting with him on, on a future episode maybe next so. time we'll facetime him and he can uh he can talk he can talk <laughs> in here with us that'd be fun well I, the la- to kind of bring this all home and and to to conclude guys western hunting might not be for everybody uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. As challenging as it was, I enjoy challenges. I like doing stuff like that, and and I'm I feel like throughout the rest of my life, and as I continue in my in my experience as a hunter, that I'm gonna enjoy the opportunities that might come to be able to do stuff like that. I feel like it it gives you another perspective. It gives you new appreciations, mm-hmm. and not only above all, it gives you experience. I will tell you, if you are going to bow hunt pronghorn antelope spot and stock you need to either have some good terrain or you need to be ready to crawl well that's something i was going to say that's something i was going to say sam is you know uh unfortunately well i'm not going to say unfortunately fortunately we had a place to stay in montana and that being one of the reasons we went to montana to hunt pronghorn because we had a place it saved us a little bit of money and so but listen guys half of that distance 10 hours closer in New Mexico, there's just as many and just as big pronghorns that Sam and I drove by on the side of the freaking road there and back. Uh, so you don't have to go to Montana to hunt pronghorn. If you don't know anything about it, New Mexico has tons of pronghorn. It's pretty close. And I, the reason why I'm saying this is because that's a long ways to drive and be disappointed if you don't archery hunting now. If you're archery hunting, yeah. and that's a long ways to go and not shoot something and then have to drive that long drive back thinking about all the mistakes that you made, the reason why you're not bringing some home. Exactly. Well, Chester, I appreciate you uh, you joining me for Absolutely. for this podcast and for, for kind of recapping um, one of our one of our most highlight experiences together Man, hunting, I feel I'm like up till now. We've we've had a we've We've been hunting together for a while. We've had some pretty cool trips. We've killed yeah. some pretty stud whitetails. Sam and I have been so desperate in hunting that we've also set in a what what the what they called a two man ladder stand was really a one and a half man ladder don't, stand. Don't, raining. If we're talking about ladder stands. Do not believe the labelings that you see no, on things. No. I guarantee you, if Fall Obsession ever makes their own ladder stand, we will label it 
properly. If Absolutely. it's a two man, it's gonna fit two men. It's gonna fit two grown men. Yeah, Sam and I, <laughs> Sam, he, we look like a bunch of sar- a couple of sardines up in that thing. It was raining and cold. And I know we're getting off on a different story, but uh, just just so you guys know a little bit of history about Sam and I, we we've hunted together and done some pretty crazy things together and and came a long way. So it's been a, it's been a really good ride, and I've enjoyed it all the way. So I appreciate you, Sam. Yeah, man, I appreciate having you on on and uh, like i said to recap this this awesome trip so guys thanks for tuning in um to another or our first fall first, session yep. podcast um many to come many to come we're going to be trying to put one of these out every single week so hit that subscribe button and uh, be sure that you catch our our next episode we yep. got we got a lot of good content not only that on guys uh send us an email let us know if there's something that you want us to talk yes, about please uh, you know give us a chance to uh to talk about it and, and get our perspective on what you're talking about and the questions that you have because um we, we're open to any suggestions you guys have absolutely if you want to talk about hunting if you want us to talk about hunting gear um archery bow hunting's our bread and butter so we'll uh, we'll help you out in any way we can. Absolutely. So Chester, just want to thank you guys. Yeah, thank you guys for listening, Chester. Again, thanks yep. for being on here, man. Bet, Sam. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening. Catch you later.